Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I'm going to take another look at the NAD3020 vintage amplifier that I re-repaired in a previous video. And the video ended with me accidentally destroying the speaker terminals on this because the plastics are uh, 40 years old approximately, so they just crumbled when I wanted to do some measurements and set the DC offset of this amplifier. So today I'm going to find a solution for that problem and I'm also going to do all the adjustments that you have to do for setting this up correctly, like the DC bias and the idle current so yeah, let's get right into it, I guess. So here's where we are. Uh, these plastic clips, I managed to break two of them and I managed to glue one of them back together. I think this one was the one I repaired, uh, but this one was just lost. It was just crumbled to pieces and I wasn't able to fix it in any way. So we are going to have to remove this whole thing which is basically just uh, soldered on from the backside of the circuit board. And we're going to have to find a way of replacing this. Initially, I thought I could just buy a cheap part, which is a standard part. I thought these would fit this fine. And they look kind of similar. They have the same dimensions roughly. But as you can see, the arrangement of the ground and the actual uh, positive is different on these, so I would have to take these plastic clips out and rearrange them, which probably would end uh, with uh, breaking them. And also the contacts are on the opposite side than on this one, so I wouldn't be able to fit this in this orientation, I would have to fit it like this, which would make inserting cables rather difficult. So yeah, I stepped, I kind of stepped away from this idea. I could probably make it work by bending these contacts and by rearranging the clips and things like that. But I think what I want to try to do is to use these, which are proper screw posts which also have a banana, uh, they, they have a socket for a banana plug, which also is a good idea. And I think I should be able to fit these in here after removing that. I probably have to drill holes into the circuit board, so it's not going to be a trivial thing to do. I think it's probably worth it because these connectors are just better than these uh, yeah, spring-loaded things that are, I don't know, I, I don't particularly like these and you always get a better connection with a proper screw terminal or by using banana plugs on your speaker leads. Yeah, so that's the first thing I'm going to try. First we have to get rid of this. So yeah, as you can see it's just basically soldered to these very wide traces that go to the, the speaker terminals and then there's these little clips, plastic clips that I can probably just uh, get rid of and after desoldering these joints I should be able to just uh, lift the old speaker terminals out. So I think I want to add some fresh solder to these joints because that's going to make it easier to desolder this. So that's the first step. Yeah, I think this is going to be quite some effort. I'm just going to clip these uh, little plastic things with some side cutters and I try to just clip them flush with the board so we should be able to get this out. And yeah, the desoldering I'm just going to, I think I'm going to use some hot air and I'm uh, just a lot of patience. <laughs> That's a lot of solar in there. Yeah, this uh, solar pump, like old school solar pump, 
does quite well on this because there's a lot of solder. Yay, it's coming. There we go. <laughs> and it's still losing plastic parts. There we go. It's free. I'm going to remove some of the remaining solder there with some solder wick. Um, the solder, like these, this uh, hand pump thing, did really well. And that was the way to go, I guess, for this. So here's where we're at. Uh, this is what it looks like without the little speaker terminals there. It doesn't look bad, it's black on top anyway. I was planning to put, maybe put like a plastic mounting plate on there, but I think it should be fine to just directly screw my screw posts to the circuit board. I think this is this is kind of plastic layer on top there already, so that should be rather easy. So we are going to need two red ones and we are going to need two black ones. And I'm going to need a drill. This should fit rather nicely, I guess. Yeah, there's there's going to be some spacing issues here, but I think we might be able to get away with this. So I determined the spots where my screw posts fit and don't interfere with each other. And I think it should be perfectly fine to screw them down in these spots because there's enough room in every direction. And I think what I want to do is to um, pre-drill with the smaller drill. We need five millimeter holes for these in the end, but I'm, at first I'm going to use my awl to mark the spots where I want to drill. These are on the on the edge of these existing holes, so let's see how that's going to go. Um, I considered drilling from the back side of the board to not lift any traces by drilling from this side. But I have to modify the traces anyway, because otherwise they're going to short out after I fit the screw posts and screw them down on the circuit board. So, yeah, I think this is the way I'm going to try to do this. I hope I don't screw this up. I'm going to use a very small drill, I think a two millimeter drill to pre-drill these and then go with the five millimeter drill. Yeah, these are definitely five millimeters wide okay let me take a second to thank the sponsor for this video pcb way my favorite manufacturer of prototype pcbs that can actually also be used for audio gear restorations there's many open source projects for these to replace components and little circuit boards that you can now make yourself or have made by a manufacturer like PCBWay. They offer excellent service, super duper quality PCBs and very fast turnaround and delivery times. So I highly recommend checking them out. The link is in the video description. Let's get back to the NAD. Mad? And I'm definitely lifting the traces in those spots there, but that was to be expected. I lifted a bit of the copper there, but that's not a problem because we're gonna have to cut out portions of it anyway, because otherwise it's going to short out. I think so. Yeah, I'm going to nibble some of the remaining stuff away here. And I'm sure there's more elegant ways of doing this, but yeah, this is my way. Yeah, doesn't look half bad. Let's try and fit the, the posts there. Yeah, but hey, <laughs> doesn't look half bad. These in the center here, and this one. Okay, 
and I'm going to have to cut a bit from each uh, positive terminal, so like a little portion, so we don't short out to ground. Uh, but that's not going to be a big thing, I guess. I'm just going to use an exacto blade or something to cut out a portion of this trace, and then we should clear the ground lock even with the washer under there and things like that. And we're going to do that on this side as well. And then we should be good. So I'm just going to use a sharp blade here to see if I can cut through the traces. Ironically, it's very easy to lift these accidentally. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to do it on purpose, not that easy. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you want to do this, be really careful because I think it's really easy to hurt yourself with an operation like this. I'm just slowly carving this out. Yeah, it looks rather good to me now. Uh, I sprayed this with some isopropanol to properly see the circuit board. And yeah, we should have enough clearance there, I think. Yeah, there's plenty of room now. That's brilliant. Okay. This one should totally clear this one. Yeah. It does. It works. So I think the next step is going to be cutting the uh, rods on the end here. And they should be cut directly uh, below this nut to clear the case. I, I don't have a smaller uh, metal saw, I'm sorry. Okay, it's working. There we go. Okay, so we're just going to do that for each one. And of course, I, th I don't think these are really gold plated. They just look, they're just basically painted yellow with the conductive paint. These are not hilariously expensive ones. I found the uh, screw posts on Amazon, I think. Just needed some pretty quickly to get on with this uh, repair, refurb, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think this is going to work beautifully like that. That's excellent. It just goes both ways. And it doesn't look half bad on the from the outside as well. And it should perfectly, yeah, it perfectly clears the case. That's that's rather nice. I want to check if we get a short circuit anywhere. And then I'm going to uh, go in with the wrench and fit them tightly. So I'm just going to quickly check for short circuits. Of course, the middle ones should be shorted together, which they clearly are, but they shouldn't short out with the other ones. Yeah, there's some capacitors charging up there, but yeah, I think we're good. That's nice. Don't want to tighten these too much because otherwise you're going to break the plastic parts. But yeah, I have some spares of these uh, screw posts. So even that wouldn't be a massive setback. I think I want to secure these with some solder and also I'm going to put some uh, I don't really have Loctite, but yeah, basically Loctite is the same as cyanoacrylate glue, so I'm just going to put a dab of that into each uh, thread here, I think. And But first, let me solder these to the board so they make proper connection with the traces. That's going to be the key thing. <laughs> and for that, I'm just going to use some extra flux. And I have set my 
soldering station to the highest temperature that it can do, which is in my case 450 degrees Celsius. But yeah, these uh, obviously there's a lot of metal that we have to heat up in order to do this. So it's not gonna be that trivial to add solder that actually makes a connection to the board. Yeah, so that works rather well with the added flux and such. That should be fine. Removing some of the flux residue here. But there was flux and there's also some glue residue from where the old terminals were glued in. So yeah, I'm going to let this cool off for a while and then I'm going to put a dab of uh, super glue in there which should act as a kind of uh, Loctite like substance in this case. Basically the the hardest Loctite you can buy is basically cyanoacrylate glue which is the same as super glue. So we're going to be good there I guess. And by the way you don't want to get super glue, in case you didn't know, you don't want to get super glue on your hands. Because basically this was designed to um, glue to be a quick way of patching up wounds and such in war times. That's what it was literally designed to do. So it's very good with gluing skin. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this should now be rock solid, I guess, literally, and provide some good contact with the traces. This trace is rather cut on this end, but the, where it comes from is here and uh, yeah, it makes really good contact on that side of the post, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay, uh, I'm just going to hook up some speakers to this. I checked for shorts again, but there are still no shorts. Let's see if we can connect some speakers here and test it out. This feels much more like a, like a decent amp now with the new connectors. <laughs> okay, good news everyone. This thing still works. <laughs> And it's way easier to connect speakers to it now with the modern screw posts in the back there. Yeah, pretty happy with this mod. I procrastinated this for quite a while because I had to drill holes and such, but it worked rather smoothly. So yeah, next step is going to be setting this up, but there's one minor repair I have to do uh, before I do that, that I wanted to do previously, but I didn't do it because I forgot. And here's the little repair I want to do. Um, there is a little resistor going to the ground lock on the back of the device here, which is meant to be connected to turntables. And that is severely and utterly burned. I was able to determine from the service manual and some forum posts that that is a 47 kilo ohms resistor. Can't see it and uh, it just measures. I think it's just it's just a short at this point. So yeah, usually it's I think it's a one watt resistor. I am just going to put a two watt resistor in, probably fine um, with 47k that I had. And yeah, that's the little fix I'm going to have to do before I start working on setting this up correctly. And the legs of this resistor are insulated with some uh, mesh here that I'm going to try to salvage. Basically, I'm just going to desolder this and put the new one in and then we're probably good to go.
Okay, now that we got the basics working and this is a working amplifier again and has proper speaker connectors, I'm going to go and adjust it correctly for the idling current and the DC offset. And the first step I'm going to do is adjusting the idling current because the DC offset is uh, behind that in the circuit. So we are going to go step by step. The procedure for adjusting the idling current is not very clear in the service manual for this unit. And in fact, the service manual refers to some resistors that aren't even fitted in this version. Uh, the procedure I'm going to show you is for the early revisions of this amplifier like I have here. For later revisions, some of the resistors are fitted actually, so you don't have to do some of the steps I'm about to do, but I'm going to explain that while I work on it. So, okay, let's do that. So basically the idling current is determined by these two fixed resistors that you can see here. We are going to replace them with some nice uh, multi-turn trimmers in the process because that makes it easier to adjust the idling current uh, should that ever be necessary. And also I'm using multi-turn trimmers because they are going to be more accurate. The procedure for measuring the current or the voltage that is equivalent to the current is wrong in the service manual. Let me show you what we actually have to do. So yeah, <clears throat> this is the procedure laid out in the service manual. This is actually a page from the service manual for this exact model, the early versions. And it says to connect a millivolt meter to measure the millivolts over a resistor, R654 for the right channel. It says side channel, yeah. Um, and R653 for the left channel. RX1 and RX2 are the little resistors I've just shown you. These are used to determine the actual uh, current going to the power transistors there. And it says here to insert a one kilo ohm carbon resistor in parallel with 654 and 653. The problem is that R654 and R653 are not fitted in this version of the amplifier. So yeah, they are just basically, there is uh, on the silk screen, the positions are determined, but they are not fitted in this version. That goes for all the early revisions of this amplifier. And actually, it was quite difficult to find out the values for these that should be in there. Turns out they are 0.22 ohms resistors. So the little resistors are meant to be fitted here next to this large black resistors. Um, yeah, you can't really, I can't, it's impossible to show you because I can't even see the silk screen, but there are, uh, the silk screen says where they are supposed to go. Not very clearly, but yeah, they are supposed to go there. And um, on this model, the traces underneath there are just shorted. So the resistors are basically just shorted out by the traces. So we have to cut those traces and fit 0.22 ohms resistors in these spots to be able to determine our idling current. And that's really why I wasn't able to figure this out in the first video I made about this because there was no information. And now I found a forum post in the Audio Karma forums where somebody who did this, who worked on many of these units and set them up, just shared his procedure with the world. And yeah, actually we don't need the one kilo ohm resistors that are meant to be inserted for measuring. We ju we're just going to fit 0.22 ohms resistors on this, in these spots and measure across those because the difference in resistance is very, very insignificant. So our measurements are not going to vary a, a lot. Uh, if we don't fit the one kilo ohms resistors. As I said, in later units of this, um, these 0.22 ohms resistors are already fitted. They're actually emitter resistors from the power transistors, which makes sense also for later versions of these transistors. These ones, the early ones, have internal emitter resistors fitted, so you don't need an extra emitter resistor. That's probably why they uh, left that out. Wouldn't hurt to put it in there, I guess, but yeah, for later models of these transistors, you need an emitter resistor, and that's why they are fitted in the later versions of this 
amplifier. I guess that's enough theory. <laughs> I hope I, I don't. It's not really necessary for you to understand why this is happening, but I just wanted to briefly explain, as far as I understood it, what I gathered about this, because it was it took quite some research in the forums until I found a procedure that I trust to be legit. So. Yeah, we are going to have to desolder our RX1 and 2 resistors. And for that purpose, we are going to have to remove this rod because the uh, solder joints are right below there. So we have to take the whole faceplate off, which doesn't hurt because I can clean it in the process. And yeah, then we can take out this rod and we're going to be able to reach to the solder joints actually. So that's the plan. <laughs> so we have to get rid of all these knobs <clears throat> in order to take the faceplate off. I think these can stay in place actually. And then there are four screws on top here and on the bottom and we should be able to just pull the faceplate off. Oh, and there's this LED assembly here. Okay, so we're going to remove that as well. And now for removing this rod, we have one screw on the front and one screw on the back and it should come out, I hope. Oh, it's screwed down here on this heat sink. The heat sink is screwed down to this rod, okay. And originally there is another screw here, but that is ripped out already in this particular amplifier. Yeah, now it's coming. Okay! Now we are desoldering these two and I'm going to measure them and write the resistor values down so we can set the trimmer resistors that we're going to fit to the values that these are at because we know that they are not blowing up or anything like that so that's probably a good starting point. We are going to desolder these points and these points which are our RX1 and 2 resistors. And that's 1.5 kilo ohms for this one. And this one has 1.2 kilo ohms. Okay, so 1.5, 1.2 kilo ohms. And as replacements, I'm going to fit uh, these multi turn trimmers. As I said, um, they are probably going to be fine. These are rated for 2 kilo ohms, so you have 2 kilo ohms uh, if you turn these up all the way. And the resistance between the two outer legs here is always 2 kilo ohms or thereabouts. They are not uh, spot on 2 kilo ohms. But uh, we have to cut one of the outer legs and have our adjustable resistance between uh, the middle leg and the one of the outer legs. So we are just going to cut one leg and set this up for uh, the values we just measured just to be sure we don't blow up anything before we fit these. So yeah, we should probably f fit these the same way around. So our adjustment goes in the same direction. We should be able to bend the legs over in a way so that we can do that. Yeah, let's just cut the rightmost leg, I guess, on these. I'm going to cut it as flush as I can with my side cutters here. So we don't accidentally connect it somewhere. And then we should be able to fit these in the holes and solder them down. They should be approximately in the center from factory. Yeah, this is at 1.4. That's perfectly fine. So we're just going to fit these and then go to the next step. Okay, I got these in there. 
they are still a bit wobbly but that's because the legs are bent into shape quite a bit but uh, yeah we're going to be fine with these i think um, maybe we could add a drop of glue or something to hold them tighter but uh, yeah it's going to do fine and now for fitting the 0.22 ohms resistors that are missing in this version. And as I pointed out earlier, the positions for these are here and here. There are some pre-drilled holes. We have to free those off solder from the back side of the board and then we can insert our 0.22 ohms resistors in here and then we are going to cut the trays. And when we are finished with the alignment procedure, an important step is to um, short those traces out again. We're going to do that from the bottom. I think that's the most elegant way. This way we are going to fit the resistors permanently and we can adjust and then just bridge the trays that we're going to cut when we're finished for a normal operation. And whenever you want to adjust it again, you can just cut uh, or desolder the little bridge we built there. That's the plan. Let's see how far we get with that. So the spots we have to fit our resistors are actually here and here on the other side. Um, we have to cut the trays in between and free these from the solder to see. Um, yeah, I think I want to free these from solder at first to see if it's the correct spots on the top side of the board actually. Yeah, and there are some nice little holes there, so we are correct with our positioning here. So it's really difficult to see, but it says R654 here and uh, our holes are here and here. Let's see if we can put something in there, like a 22 ohms resistor. <laughs> yeah, these are just one watt uh, 0.22 ohms resistors there that you can fit in there. So I'm going to try and solder these in, in a way so that they are slightly elevated from the board so we can grab to them with some test clips while we're adjusting this. And I'm going to keep the component leads here because we're going to use those probably for uh, bridging the gap again after we cut it. We should now cut this trace here in both these pos positions. There we go. That's digging into the circuit board quite nicely there. Okay, so my order of operations was not the brightest idea. Uh, you could, of course, cut the trace and then measure across these points and see if actually the short is gone. Now we are basically measuring a short because it's just a, a very small resistance between there. So I'm not able to confirm for sure that these traces are cut, but I'm just going to trust my work here. So, yeah. Um, we should now be able to perform the adjustment procedure, actually. Yeah, to be honest, I'm a bit stumped uh, because the procedure as laid out in the forum doesn't work for me, it seems. I have, uh, yeah, I, I did some work off camera and I have replaced the little resistors because I thought they were maybe faulty with some other ones. And yeah, as you can see, I've hooked up my uh, probes now to the bottom side of the board and yeah across the resistor which is what I'm supposed to do and I cut the trace in the right spot I triple checked everything the trimmers do work 
I have uh, measured the resistance uh, there and we can actually adjust the resistance there, but we don't see any uh, change in the voltage across the resistors. And yeah, let me show you this. That is about what we get. It's very close to zero or even zero. And yeah, then I went on and connected my 8 ohms dummy load to the speaker terminals and we got a bit higher regarding the millivolts, but it's still too low. We got around half a millivolt with the load connected and uh, turning the trimmer resistors there didn't change anything about the value. So I kind of assume that for some reason that I can't figure out, this procedure doesn't work in my case, because maybe somebody modded this in a way that I can't see or something like that. It should actually, you should warm this up for five minutes, set the volume to zero and uh, have a reading and then set it up with the trimmers to between five millivolts and 11 millivolts. And that should be the whole procedure. But for some reason that I can't really grasp at this point, I don't get any reading at all. The amplifier still works. I checked it in between uh, tests runs, but yeah, I don't, I'm, I, I really don't know why this wouldn't work. Did everything according to plan. Uh, so most likely this procedure is going to work for everybody else, except for me. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Further investigation is needed, I guess. Yeah, and it's also the exact same for both channels. I've now uh, unplugged the amplifier again. This should technically be the way to do it. Uh, just measuring the voltage across these split parts and after the adjustment you just close this gap and the amplifier is going to be set up correctly. But yeah, it doesn't do anything in my case. I think I want to remove the resistors and try some other ones. Maybe the resistors are just open or something. I'm not sure. There should be something coming through there and as the amplifier still works and outputs a signal to the speaker terminals, I'm not quite sure what. If anybody knows, let me know in the comments and uh, maybe we're going to have to figure this out together. This seemed very legit and I was hoping that this procedure would work. So for now I'm just going to resolder some other resistors on there. I found some uh, 0.33 ohms ones that are a bit beefier. I guess these are at least 2 watts rated. The ones I put in there are allegedly 1 watt rated, which should be more than enough actually. So yeah, not quite sure what's happening here. But let's try with the other resistors before I completely give up. And also I've set the trimmers to around the values the uh, fixed resistors were. And I got them back to that. They are like, if you measure across them now in conjunction with the other resistors that are fitted there, you get around 150 ohms and I set them both to 150 ohms. So we should be pretty close to how this used to be set up. But yeah, I still would love to be able to uh, set this up spot on, which should be possible. But yeah, as I said, I'm not sure why this wouldn't work. So I'm going to remove the 0.22 amps resistors. Uh, Wow, okay, um, not amps, of course, but ohms. I'm going to remove these for now. And as I said, I tried several from my batch of uh, 0.22 ohms resistors, and they seem to be good, really, but yeah, who knows. I'm just going to put the beefier ones in there. And of course, we are going to have to set this up to slightly different values for these. Just going to solder them on from the backside here. Why can't something just work from the get-go? These are going to be removed anyway. So I'm just going to set them up like so. And if that fails, I'm just going to short the traces again, I guess. Because it was working. There we go. And I also, of course, I measured if I have a short still there, which would explain 
the uh, the measurement of zero volts I measured uh, across these and measured for continuity and in fact our little uh, break there works they are not shorted out anymore so we should be able to measure something across these hmm okay let's try that again shall we and yeah we are supposed to warm this up for five minutes to get uh, stable readings here but I guess we should have some kind of reading. Yeah, no. It's still very, very low. Hmm. So as you can see here, I still get around the same reading there. Not sure why at all. Hmm. I'm not sure why this happens. So I'm just going to short these traces out, I guess, at this point, and maybe somebody has an idea what else to try. But in theory, this should be the correct procedure and you should be able to do this. And in the forums I visited, I'm going to link that in the description, of course, uh, people seem to have success with this exact method. Yeah. So I'm removing my resistors and just shorting out the traces again so we have this. Uh, back to the original configuration. Should have around the same uh, values for the resistance there. Yeah, I'm just going to use some component leads that I have left over. So now they are shorted again. Yeah, still, this should work for everybody else except for me. Yeah, I just made the decision to revert this back to its original state regarding the trimmers because for some reason I couldn't really get anything measurable out of those. I think maybe it's because I used very cheap trimmers and the procedure I've shown you should technically work perfectly fine. And it seems to have worked for a lot of people in the forums I was referring to. I have no idea why it didn't work for me. But yeah, these uh, values that I put in there again are a 1.2 kilo ohms and 1.5 kilo ohms resistor and they should be close enough. At least this was working perfectly fine with these and uh, I tested it with these in place now and it continues to work perfectly fine, sounds beautiful and yeah. As I said, I have no idea why the procedure didn't work for me, but this seems to be a reasonable workaround at this point because I don't want to mess it up with setting the idle current completely off and this should at least uh, be close to the correct settings. So what I'm going to do now is to set the DC offset on the speakers and these trimmers that are originally fitted on the board are for that. We're just going to hook up some leads to the speaker terminals. And thankfully I have banana plugs now, so I can just use banana plug uh, test leads. And we're going to set these so that we are as close as possible to zero volts on both channels. So let's do that. So this should be pretty straightforward. I'm just doing the left channel first. Just hooking up my test leads here, setting this to millivolts DC because it's the DC offset. We're measuring DC here, of course. And we are going to turn this on and basically just uh, trim these trimmers to reach as close to zero as we can after a period of five minutes of warming this up, which is the recommended time. So yeah, I'm just going to set a timer for five minutes and then uh, set the volume to zero, basically, and then we should see a value that is very close to zero volts. And as you can see, after first switching this on, the value is kind of stabilizing. So the, while the components heat up, this is going to uh, fluctuate a bit and then it's going to stabilize at some point. And then that's the point where we can make our measurement and our setting. I've waited five minutes to warm this up and as you can see we are pretty stable at 2.4 millivolts or something which is already really good. I've said this before. Maybe we can get it a bit lower. These are, these are really fiddly to set up. 
think that was about the best we could get. <laughs> yeah, I think we're not going to go anything. It's, it's around 2 millivolts, which is a really, really good, uh, really good measurement there. Let's see for the other channel. I'm just hooking the positive lead up to the other channel. We should use the, these are obviously, uh, this is for the left channel and this one is for the right channel. So yeah, that's a 27. That's still pretty good actually. 27 millivolts is not too shabby. We can probably get this a bit lower. Yeah, and you could of course replace these uh, resistors as well. So this one we seem to get to around minus five, which is really good. It seems to be, as I've read on the forums, that one channel is always a bit, a bit out of range there. For some reason, I don't know, these are pretty nasty uh, circuits after all, but, and these trimmers are old, probably would be a good idea to replace them, but I don't have any suitable replacements for those. So we're going to go with what we have. Yeah, and we got this pretty low to 2.5 or thereabouts. That's really good. It's still fluctuating a bit. It's not quite stable, but it's going to stabilize the longer this warms up. And this is a really low value. So yeah, I'm pretty satisfied with this setting. At least that worked. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to wash the faceplate a bit that I took off in the process. And then I'm going to put the whole thing back together for now. Probably maybe going to revisit the idle current uh, setting, but it should be pretty much spot on with the original resistors fitted back in there. And it sounds beautifully, still works beautifully. And uh, I've had this running for several hours without any thermal issues. So no thermal runway or anything like that. Just works as it is. So yeah, we should be good. And I kind of hope this was still informative for you. Uh, yeah, Procedures should work like that. You can actually see that there's a little rod on this part. That's where it goes on the front part here. And I'm not taking these uh, knobs or push buttons off, except for this one, because it just came off, because they are not very sturdily on there. Usually a drop of glue uh, helps keeping them in place, especially these ones, which are <laughs> spring-loaded, so that they sometimes they just fly off. And I've seen many of these amps missing one or two of these knobs, because they are just uh, catapulted away. <laughs> And yeah, actually I replaced one of these on this one because it was missing and uh, put a, a bit of glue under one because it was loose. The LED just clips into this little retainer here. this. It seems I've lost all the screws. <laughs> These should all be standard size screws. I think maybe this didn't come with all the screws in there when I got it. I don't remember. I would have to re-watch my video. <laughs> but I have enough replacement. These are just standard M3 screws, I think definitely have enough of those spare. And this, yeah, we could repaint this part, but it's good enough. And I still have the screws for that. I think it was missing most of the screws from the bottom, actually. So, yeah. It's not going to win any kind of beauty contest. <laughs> but 
at least it works and it's set up good enough. I'm going to give this to a friend and yeah, hopefully he's going to enjoy it. So these ones you want to adjust for the center position. Then we just push them in. And the volume is adjusted for the minimum position. So we're going to put this in like so. And then it hopefully should work. Yeah, and indeed, this still works fine and it sounds beautiful and yeah, I kind of like these little amplifiers a lot um, regarding the sound and their understated looks. I'm quite fond of it. Yeah, I'm quite satisfied with the results. I would, of course, obviously have preferred to uh, get the settings right, but for some reason it didn't work as you've seen. And yeah, other than that, this is a fully working, kind of slightly refurbished uh, amplifier now. I replaced all the faulty components at least. I got it to work fine. I replaced all the capacitors in previous videos. I tried to set it up correctly, but it didn't work. I set the uh, DC offset, at least that is pretty much spot on now. There are so many things that you could do additionally, like replacing some of the diodes that are on here, but the circuitry seems to work fine, so I just left it as is for now. And I hope I'm going to give this to a friend soon, and I hope he's going to get some joy out of this because yeah, I have enough amplifiers here, otherwise I would hold on to this for sure because I kind of love it. It's a, it's a lovely little amplifier. I'm pretty fond of these. Yeah, I hope you liked this video and found it entertaining and maybe a bit informative. I haven't been able to show you everything I wanted to show you, at least not uh, the results, but the procedure I've shown for the idle current alignment should technically work for uh, these models, these early models. Later models, as I've pointed out, have resistors fitted in some positions and the procedure varies a bit. I hope you like this. Hope to see you again on this channel. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.